Hi friends, it's your man Adam here with Worldwide Stereo. Thank you. I want to say thank you for coming to this next episode here of our Lunch and Learns. Uh, I'm going to wait a little bit here while until everybody gets kind of logged in. So let me know how everybody's doing, where you're coming from today. Uh, it's a wonderful, beautiful day out here. Well, I'm inside, but outside, it's a wonderful day. Um, but uh, today's uh, Lunch and Learn is going to be pretty, pretty awesome. We're going to be talking about speakers. And I got a really cool special guest that I can't wait to introduce you to. Um, so again, this is our latest episode, uh, Lunch and Learn, 12 noon Eastern time here. And tomorrow, uh, just remind everybody who's logging in right now, we're going to do another show on Thursday, which is back to our hi-fi happy hour. And we'll do a follow-up to this call. So uh, great to see everybody. Let me see who's kind of logging in. Hey, Jim's here. What's going on, Jim? How are you doing? Thank you so much for joining. Justin here from Philly. All right, local. What's up, Justin? Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining today. It's going to be an awesome show. So I hope that you saw the... Oh, and it's Judd. What's up, Judd? How you doing, buddy? We might be uh, mentioning something about you later. Just saying. You never know. So stay tuned. And Rodney here. Love these events. Thank you so much, Rodney. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining with us. All right, friends. So let's get into a little bit today. Lunch and Learn is all about speakers, okay? And what is the right kind of speaker for you? Uh, there's so many different kinds out there. You have floor standing speakers and wall speakers, speakers for outside, speakers for inside, speakers that are weatherproof or shower proof or all these kinds of options for theaters. So I want to introduce you to a very special guest. Okay. I'm glad to have him with us. He's from Bowers and Wilkins. All right. Bowers and Wilkins. I think they know a thing or two about making speakers. What do you think? I think so. Um, so I want to introduce him one second. I'll get him up on the screen for you. I got to call him first and, and hop him in. So here we go. And we go here. And that, and there he is. Hi, up, everyone. Seth? <laughs> All right, friends. This is Seth Snyder from Bowers and Wilkins. Bowers and Wilkins, uh, Seth, meet my friends. <laughs> How are you? You've got a lot of friends, man. Look I do. I got yeah, friends, yeah. friends in low places, friends in high places. I got friends all over the place. Excellent. It's great. So Seth is from Bowers and Wilkins here, and he's going to help us guys today talk about different kinds of speakers that are out there because Bowers and Wilkins certainly does a ton with making speakers and providing speakers for pretty much everything uh, out there. So they certainly know what they're doing here. So Seth, why don't you introduce yourself, tell us a little about uh, yourself, and then also you can dive right into uh, Bowers and Wilkins and tell us a little bit about them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Seth Snyder. I am from Bowers and Wilkins. I've been working for them for quite some time now, and uh, I'm the retail sales manager for the Northeastern Corridor of the United States. So uh, I get to hang. I got a great job. I get to hang out with Adam and listen to cool music. It's a uh, it's a fun <laughs> gig. Um, I, I'm a big music lover. Always have been. I'm going completely stir crazy because I can't go to any concerts right now, oh. uh, which is usually around two or three a month for me. But, really? But unfortunately, you know, we we have to stay home and listen to music here. But yeah, I um I sold Bowers and Wilkins speakers for a while. I I've, I've been a big fan of the brand for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, it's a it's a great company to work for. They make fantastic products. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, the company uh, Bowers and Wilkins. In case anybody is unfamiliar with the brand, we've been around. Yeah, we've been around since '66. Uh, Our journey started in the '40s. Our founder John Bowers uh, was a radio technician um, in World War uh, II. And that's what we knew for years. And then our uh, our marketing team did a little bit into a deeper dive. We're a British company, and they are the British people who work for Bowers and Wilkins always told us that he was a, a radio specialist. And they very typical British understated they left it at that. Turns out he was a radio specialist in MI6. They left out James Bond. So <laughs> make sure that we we preface that with he was a radio technician and MI6 was responsible for decoding Nazi messages during World War II. And that's where he kind of got his start into this whole radio world. He opened up a shop with his friend Roy Wilkins uh, when he came back from the war uh, in a place called Worthing. It's on the southern coast of uh, the UK. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, back then, the speakers were different. There was, there was, a, there was a little bit different flavoring for all the different manufacturers that were out there. Mm -hmm. And Worthing is like a 45 minute drive from London. So he would go see the London Symphony Orchestra at Royal Albert Hall. And then from home, yeah, right? Oh. Come home, 
and listen on his system and things weren't quite right. They that. Thing. <laughs> so he started tinkering with uh, the different speakers. He reinforced the drive units, build better cabinetry, adjust the crossover, you know, start to do all those, those teching things to build a better speaker. You can sell those speakers. Yeah. And one of his customers uh, loved their, her speakers so much, Miss White, that she left him her whole estate and allowed him to start his own speaker company. So in 66, mm. our, uh, our company was founded. Wow. And, uh, since then, we try to take an approach of staying out of the way. Okay. The artist knows what you're supposed to hear. And we tried to be as true to that representation of the recording as possible, not adding any flavoring or anything like it. John always said the, the speaker that gives you the most is the one that loses the least. And that is the one that that's that that mantra's plastered yeah. all over our facilities all over the world. Okay. Uh, and since then, uh, a lot of professionals use our, our 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 equipment and it's not a pro line, it's the same line that you can buy a worldwide stereo. So it's a it's it's a great it's a great line. Yeah, yeah, I've certainly seen a lot of you know you, when uh, whenever you do some research on B and W, you see them um, talk about all the uh, mastering studios and and Hollywood studios and things like that that certainly use the product. So uh, you're definitely out there in, in the world and you make a nice product. So certainly with today, what we're talking about today, uh, you're going to be a great asset to helping uh, helping my friends kind of decide what what speakers are right for them. You know, because like like I said, there's there's different there's so many different kinds. Speaking of that. What's behind you? Is that an 804 D3? Yep. Is that what that is? That is an 804 D3 in Rosenut. Mm. Uh, I'm a baby. I have been upgrading my system for years. Yeah. And uh, I finally got the diamonds. So I bought these a couple years ago and I, I absolutely love them. There yeah. And I'm a sucker for that Rosenut finish personally. I think it's it's gorgeous. And then what do you got a turntable back there? Yeah. That's a uh, little a little project. RPM one. It's actually my first turntable. I uh, I oh. I never had a turntable before, and I wanted to get into the world of uh, of vinyl. Hey, it's so much fun! It's so much fun. Welcome to the club. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fun club to be I, in. The account doesn't agree, but it's so much fun. Oh, I, so that's I, it. oh yeah. <laughs> well, that's you were saying that's crazy. You go to to a couple concerts a uh, um, uh, a month typically, so that's awesome. Have you found a way to? I mean, besides just listening to music, I mean, maybe I can offer a suggestion here. There's, I don't know if you heard of Nugs.net. Um, yeah. So you, oh, you so you're on them. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that. I haven't jumped in yet. I've oh. found that a lot of my favorite bands are yeah. starting to perform on their own YouTube channels. I'll get an alert. That too. Watch is performing in ten minutes. I'm like, I'll gotta jump on the computer and see. Yeah. But no, it's great. Actually, the, the the concerts is why I bought the turntable in the first place. I'm a oh, okay. roll guy, and uh, of the heavier variety. So I would go to all these concerts, and I always like to support the artist when I'm there and pick up a T-shirt. But when your closet becomes filled with death metal T-shirts and punk rock T-shirts <laughs> that you can't wear in public, <laughs> like I'll buy a record instead. <laughs> well, now you have all those T-shirts. You can just wear them around the house. Exactly. So, so you can wear them as much as you want. <laughs> Oh man! All right, so that was that was a little bit of fun there. So let's get uh, let's get onto the topic here a little bit. I want to start talking about um, all the different kinds of speakers that are out there and, and why you would choose one over the other. Uh, so, folks, if you have questions about this, this is the time to answer. I mean, how many times are you going to have Seth in front of you from Bowers and Wilkins, a guy here that that has his life wrapped around speakers twenty four seven and deals with it all the time? So, please. Bring your questions and we'll answer them. Just remember that there is a 30 second delay. So if I asked you right now to type Adam is the most awesome man in the world in about 30 seconds, you would see that start popping through on the comments. OK, so it takes a little bit for us to get to them. So just just be patient. We will get to them. So bring them on. All right. So I want to start talking about standalone speakers. Um, Standalone speakers, uh, you know, your traditional, what we call a, a box speaker, like what you have behind you there, Seth, that's an 80, 804 is what I would consider a standalone speaker. If someone's trying to do, let's say, uh, well, I'll, I, won't, I won't start it that way. I'll say, why would somebody want that kind of speaker? What kind of applications do you think a standalone speaker works best for? Okay. Uh, standalone speakers are, are my personal favorite, but don't let my personal persuasions persuade you. Um, you got to choose the speaker that's that's right for your application. For my application, I wanted a high performance speaker mm -hmm. that created a three dimensional sound space in my room, and I think a box speaker does a really great job with that. Okay. I also find speakers. I think our speakers are absolutely beautiful. So it's more. It's it doesn't necessarily have to be a statement piece, 
but I like the look of a speaker in the room. Um, I also like the mobility of the speaker. Uh, these are, this is not the final spot for these speakers. I originally bought these speakers and I had them in a little tiny square foot apartment, it's like 750 square foot apartment in Queens when I lived okay. in Gloria. And now that I've relocated to South Jersey, I can bring my speakers with me, which is a great uh, application for anyone who's looking to buy a long-term investment like a speaker can be. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of a box speaker because you can grow with it. Uh, there's a center channel that uh, that pairs with this speaker. There yeah. are speaker box speakers that are surround speakers that work with it. So I can I started with a stereo system with with the anticipation of building it into a multi-channel system for theater at some point. Okay, and box speaker allows me to do that. So I have the hmm. little positive and negative terminals on the back. Those <laughs> haven't ever changed. They don't ever go out of style. So <laughs> I'm gonna have these puppies for a long time. Hopefully. Sure. I mean, certainly when you're when you guys when you're thinking about a a, a box speaker solution, um, aesthetics come into play. I mean, we're talking about taking up some space in your room, so that is always a consideration, and why many uh, speaker manufacturers focus so highly on the look of the speaker. You know, and as you get not only as you as you start to maybe get into the what we'll call higher performing speakers, you're going to see that they're starting to look a little nicer because now they have the budget to start to play with those decorative things, which is important. I mean, it's a piece, it's a piece of furniture. It's a statement piece in the room. So that sometimes can be a driving factor in purchasing a speaker. Um, so, you know, so we're already starting to get questions here. I want to do this one right here. Jim, do I have to spend 5, 10, and 20 Gs or more to get high-end sound? What do you think? What do you think there? Your, your budget's your budget. I mean, I always uh, encourage people, like, what if you're using it for music, uh, let's get the most enjoyment out of your music. Let's start with the content that you're using first. If you want, if you got $5,000 to spend, there is absolutely a system that, that we can build for you. Would it sound as good as a $20,000 system? Probably not, but all things are relative. We got to find that sweet spot for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the important thing with with our brand is that our products they range anywhere from 175 bucks all the way up to 60,000 bucks for a pair of speakers. We don't want to block anyone out from having a great experience with our speakers. So yeah. there's yeah. a lot of options. Uh, the important thing is working with a professional who knows how to who knows how to build a system, so you get the one that's right for you. Audio is a really personal choice. It is. To make sure we get the the right solution for you. So you know, I we could build an awesome system for five grand. Are you kidding me? I, I started out with a system that was like. <laughs> I think my first ever system was probably about five hundred bucks, actually. <laughs> you know, so it it it, it, it uh, you know, so Jim, I, I would say certainly with you know, like. Um, uh, Seth was saying your budget is your budget, obviously, but you know, do you have to spend that much money? Well, if you can, that's great, and it'll be a fantastic system, you know. But for five grand, five to ten thousand dollars, there's there's certainly lots of speakers and systems we can put together uh, to, to 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 fill that need and get you what I would even say, at five grand. That can be a high end stereo sound. I mean, it's going to sound great. So absolutely. And speaking of, I'm going to jump off here for one second as far as maybe a little bit of my flow. But you mentioned your sixty thousand dollars speaker, so I just kind of have to show everybody, guys. Look at those. <laughs> I mean, that is you know I had the privilege of going to uh, uh, the facility up in here in, in in Boston and taking a tour. And when you see these things, you know, standing right there in front of you, it's they're it's amazing. It's an amazing looking thing. So Seth, what the heck is that? What's the name of that speaker? That's our uh, that's our Nautilus speaker. That's our flagship speaker. Uh, we made that speaker back in the '90s. Uh, our founder, John Bowers, uh, unfortunately, he in '87 he got cancer, and he he threw everything at. He's like, I want to make the most fantastic speaker ever built as my farewell. Um, and the Nautilus is what uh, he approached. Now, the funny thing about that speaker is that. Um, when you look at like the different parts of a speaker, uh, mm -hmm. the cabinet is the, the biggest pain. It's the thing that you're constantly getting to quiet down. So essentially act like it's not there. Right. Cabinets, you only hear the drivers. Um, so that, so that, that, that project was an approach to try to build a speaker without a cabinet. As you can see, hmm. we failed. <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty miserably. Hashtag fail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but those, uh, but that shape 
have inherent acoustical advantages that yep. the shape of that snail is for is to dissipate the back wave coming off the back of the speaker mm -hmm. so while that speaker is you know pushing 30 years old now uh it still is in our assortment because it still does things that our other speakers don't quite do i mean when you you heard it in boston when you sit in front of that those two speakers mm -hmm. they disappear they are yeah and all you have is the music. It's a fantastic speaker. Guys, on those woofers, if I if I remember my uh, my training properly on that, it's about 14 and a half feet of tubing on those bottom end uh, uh, woofers. I mean, that's, so that's why they, uh, the other ones, you know, they extend out and straight back, but you know, you can't have a speaker 14, 15 feet into the room. <laughs> so that, wow. that's why they coiled it up for that. So that was cool. So just wanted to show that with you guys. That's something that is a statement piece from them and it's it's gorgeous. And as you can see, you can get them in any finish that you desire, you just you just name it. Absolutely, send up the uh, little paint code, and we'll build it to that <laughs> uh, for you. So, moving on, we just we just finished up kind of talking about some box speakers and, and why somebody would choose that. And again, we're keeping uh, to the point of with the box speaker, it's going to be part of the room. So, you want it to maybe match some furniture, as you can see behind me. I have speakers that kind of have a a nice wood tone to them. I have a lot of wood and barn wood in this in my room here, so it kind of flows with with my room so that's always important as much as sometimes performances but what if i didn't want to see my speakers and that's another category that's out there there's speakers that we can you know kind of cut into the into the wall and 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 make them flush so they don't take up room um what kind of what kind of applications do you see a lot of those speakers uh going in seth oh yeah so anytime you're going to try to hide a speaker a stealth system so to speak uh, it, it, not just for, for aesthetics too. Like, let's say you're like me and, um, you've got a two-year-old who mm -hmm. loves to poke at bass drivers. Uh, <laughs> you want to make sure you get that off the floor. We have an entire line at a variety of different price points. I mean, a lot of architectural solutions that we can put in your wall, right? There is the uh, CWM 8.5. Mm -hmm. So that's the equivalent of a diamond speaker that goes in your wall. Uh, our approach is from a performance perspective. We're a performance company, so all of our speakers are designed to sound as accurate as possible. The problem that you run into when you have an architectural solution is that there are three main parts of any speaker. You've got the drivers, you've got the crossover, and you've got the cabinet. Drywall is a pretty crappy material to make a cabinet out of, and that's what ends up becoming your... Uh, your cabinet whenever you put a speaker in the wall. So what we so we have some pretty ingenious ways of putting a cabinet inside your wall so mm -hmm. you don't see it. But behind that speaker right there, there's a box that's about as tall as me that's bolted to the studs inside the wall. Right. So that way you can get all the advantages of this beautiful cabinet back here, but you just don't see it. It's inside the wall. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to show people the, this is what we consider an architectural speaker, which you can do in the wall, or you can also do in the ceiling. And another thing that to, to point here, a lot of our installations will get just as they can paint the $60,000 speakers, any color you want, we can get a sample of your paint and we can have our guys actually spray those grills. So it matches up. So you don't have this Maybe you have a, a dark room like that for a theater and you want to blend the speaker into the into the paint. We can do that so you don't end up seeing it. Um, so just a nice a nice touch to do with an in-wall speaker. And certainly the concern typically with a uh, an in-wall speaker, as Seth was mentioning, was, you know, the drywall is just it's just not a great material for a speaker. It's just folks. It's not it's it's it's, it's a bad material. We try and not, not limit the vibrations from drywall and things like that all the time. So for for a good in wall speaker, you want the performance of a standalone speaker, but you want something architectural. Those back boxes really do uh, really do come in handy. They're great for getting speakers and music in place where you can't have it uh, in with a, a standalone speaker, too. Like 805s, 804s, they're not fitting in my bathroom. But a simple architectural in ceiling speaker, now I can rock out in the shower without taking up any space. Absolutely. The applications are just great. Yep. Here's a great question that came in from Mark here. He says, I have a small dedicated room for vinyl listening using small tower speakers. Full soundstage enjoyment requires higher volumes. Would bookshelf size speakers provide better sound at lower volumes? Um, no, I think a better speaker uh, is, is always. What, what I go, go to, uh, is the speaker efficient enough to fill up that that room? Do you get the clarity that you want? Do you get that depth uh, that you want? It has to do with um, the level of speaker and the level of electronics that you have. I have always found, too, there's a little bit of, you know, 
uh, of of me in there where sometimes music sounds better loud. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a, there is a bit of that, yep. uh, but no, a room filling sound um, to get things to to sound good. Uh, there's a lot of variables in there that it could be. I found that um, it's all about pressurizing that room space. Do you have okay. enough air moving? in order to feel it, if that's what you mean by sounding good. Uh, and there, at, that, at that point, there's really no uh, replacement for displacement. Uh, a bigger speaker, a bigger speaker, even though it's a small room, might be an advantageous solution for you. Yeah, it could be. You know, my take on this, because I get this question a lot, you know, I have a small room or I was able to carve out like an eight by 10 spot in the basement and I want to do like a listening room or something like that. Um, there, there's so much to consider when you're when you're putting speakers into a room, as Seth was talking about, you know, you're creating waves. The speakers put sound out into the world and they create waves inside of your room. And those waves bounce around all over the place. So there's a lot to say about not only the right size speaker for the room, but also getting the sound of the room right. And we talked a little bit about that on some of my other uh, lunch and learns about treating the room. Uh, you know, when I did, I think it was at the SVS, we talked about room reflections and, and, uh, and, uh, and treating the room with sound and actually, and a few more of these lunch and learns. I'm going to have another guest on that. We're going to go a little bit deeper into this about treating the room, but that's important too, Mark. So yeah. um, the right speaker for the room, yeah, it could be a towered speaker. And at lower volumes, that has a little bit more to do with efficiency, speaker efficiency and the equipment that you have there, being able to produce a lot of sound at lower volume. So keep those kind of things in mind. Uh, but ultimately, it's your ears and it's your experience. You know, uh, we talked about listening being a very personal thing and how everybody likes to hear their sound. And I think I'm uh, I'm with Seth where a little bit of volume uh, goes a long way. If you um, like <laughs> I like to feel the music, you know, when you're listening. Like, so when you crank it up and you're listening, like, I, I want to feel the music against my body a little bit. And that's what's so great about a live show. So that's my personal thing. And there's a lot of people out there like headphones. That's a different listening experience where I think you don't get a chance to feel the music. But, oh, my God, the the the, the clarity that you can get and, and trying to listen for all the maybe imperfections or perfections in the music that comes across because the headphones are right against your ears versus speakers out in space that are that are hitting you. So it's just all different. And, and um, I'm starting to geek out a little bit as I do all the time, but it's just, it's so different, you know, the different kinds of speakers that are out there. And I, I personally love it. You know, like I said, hitting you, it's, it's a great experience that way. Um, all right, let me get caught up here on where we're at with some comments. Okay. So we just, we talked about some box speakers, all right? We talked about uh, maybe why somebody would go to uh, an, an in wall and all of these solution guys, you can, you can do them for, I'm saying solutions as in, you know, two channel listening, or uh, maybe you want to do a theater room, or maybe you want to have music around the house. And both of those box speakers or uh, well, standalone speakers, as I called them, and the in walls will fit that need, not a problem. Um, but I want to move a little bit right now to talking more about specifically, let's talk about some theaters. You know, if you're building a theater, um, now here's an area where maybe you don't want to see the speakers at all because. When you go to a, a, a professional theater or a commercial theater, you know, your Regals and AMC theaters of the world, you don't see much. You know, you have the massive screen in front of you and the screen is actually acoustically transparent. It's got holes in it. And it's perforated to allow that sound to protrude through because all the speakers are behind the screen. And there's specific kind of speakers out there that are made specifically for theaters. Um, so what, what makes those different, Seth? What's different on that based on you know, maybe if you're doing a, a listening room, what's different about the theater-based speakers? Uh, a couple things. Uh, number one is the the application of those speakers. We we have a custom theater line um, mm -hmm. of a couple different models uh, for these applications because, and we started it because we started to get calls from uh, places like Worldwide Stereo that they felt bad about hiding our diamonds behind faux, uh, faux walls. Yeah. <laughs> like you don't want to hide something like that. Um, but also because there's some inherent costs in making a speaker that beautiful. Uh, and if you're not going to see it or well, why pay for it? Uh, so we have a custom theater line that are designed to uh, be hidden behind the walls. They're big boxes. Um, they, they sit behind the screen or, or behind the faux walls. That's a, that's a theater that's in our, our, our facility over in the UK. That's a 7.7 .7, uh, CT8 theater. Mm -hmm. 
And what those speakers do on the other side is they play at exceptional high volumes. Gunshots mm -hmm. are not subtle. They are loud, they are concussive, and they reach extreme decibels or decibel levels. Okay. Uh, you want to be able to have the, the disparity between the soft parts of music and the loud parts of music to have the most dramatic effect. And that, that lineup, I mean, that system right there, that'll pump at 120 decibels easily. So when it's time, wow. yeah, when it's time to rock, I mean, rock concerts sound real. If you got a Blu-ray disc of like that Blu-ray uh, Snakes and Arrows, uh, that Rush, uh, that Rush. Oh, yeah. It sounds like they're there. It's Metallica sounds like Metallica. It's um, it's a great system. Uh, but you have to with the with systems like that, you're, you're dealing with a dedicated space typically. Uh, we put them in living rooms too, behind you know, fashionably behind uh, in in custom cabinetry. Yeah, uh, it, this this is when this is a this line is for when you know no holds barred. I want it to sound like a theater. And I, Adam, I know I ran into it when I was on the sales floor back in the day. Yeah, a lot of customers said, "How do I make it sound like the theater in my living room?" And it's always like. Well, get close. We can get close. With, with this, you you can you can actually exceed what you'll get at your local theater. This okay. So you mentioned just to put some things in perspective for my friends out there. We mentioned it can play at 120 decibels, um, guys. A good concert's about 110. So think of the last concert that you were at, and 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 what that experience is. If it was a great sounding concert, your ears weren't ringing when you left. But if it was, your ears probably were ringing. So and that has nothing to do with volume. It's all about distortion. That's what really kills your ears and tires your ears out. So um, 120 decibels. That's uh, that's yeah, and you, <laughs> you, you mentioned like that's because it's yeah. up, because it's Bowers and Wilkins, like, yeah, it can play at 120 decibels, but it is in no way a big dumb theater speaker. It can yeah. play with delicacy at lower volumes mm -hmm. so that the score of the, of the, of the film that you're watching comes through smooth and detailed and mm -hmm. inviting. So when you play it that, and we do it at the office at the theater that you've been to, Adam. Oh yeah. We'll finish the day off with a, uh, a live cut of Metallica playing one in Montreal. Yes. And when you're done, your ears don't hurt. It right. you don't get that ringing in your ears. Mm -hmm. It feels good and it feels comfortable. You might get the cops called on you, but it might. <laughs> <laughs> it might. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the the best con. Well, I say the best sounding concert that I've ever been to, and my friends know out there. I'm a big Tool fan, so that was. I, I left that concert and my ears weren't ringing. I couldn't believe it. You know, an hour and a half, or, you know, two hours of Tool, and I was like, "Wow, I'm not. My ears aren't ringing." And I I wanted to give like the sound guy a high five because <laughs> yeah. was, it was just awesome. So okay. you can listen to stuff loud as long as it's not. Um, you know, a lot of distortion there. So, and so in dealing with theaters, you know, you have, you have speakers that you want to put back there. And certainly the, the, the B and W box theater speaker system CT eight is, is definitely a good choice, but this is also another area uh, folks to consider uh, our architectural speakers that we were talking about, because you can build a wall and you can put those speakers in the wall and then you can put the screen in front of them. We do that all the time. Uh, we can also wrap the room in fabric and things like that. So that's typically your best solution for, a theater when you want to hide the speakers you do need something that's going to either go behind a false wall and why and why on earth would you want to hide a, a beautiful 800 series speaker like an 804 back there but sometimes you do <laughs> sometimes we do uh but that that leaves less room too because now you have like a, an 804 is going to require a good cavity of, of space behind that screen versus an in wall you can you can squeeze it so you can get more seating area possibly in the theater so that's something to consider when you're when you're dealing with a theater design. Um, I'm going to take a look around here, see if there's any questions coming in that we want to get to. Uh, here's a good one. I like this one actually. So for a two channel listening room, what's your take on sub versus no sub? Yes. Go ahead, well, Seth. There's a little sub back there in mine, so that's my take. <laughs> 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 I have two of them, yeah. so that's my take. Yeah, <laughs> that, exactly. I I only have one because I haven't bought the second one yet, and it's uh, it, it's gonna happen. No, there's this there's this thing uh, that exists, and it, maybe it's a regional thing. Um, but there's a lot of different kinds of subwoofers out there. Mm -hmm. But Americans typically get introduced to subs uh, sometime in high school when people are bringing <laughs> seventeen of them in the trunk of a car. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly, and that's a cool solution. I was that guy. We, uh, we all were. <laughs> so I think everyone in this chat probably was on some level. Um, but 
the thing to, to remember is there's all different, they're all, all different types of subs. So mm -hmm. the sub behind me is a closed box uh, DB3. Okay. Uh, so with that sub, it has the ability to do what I like to do with two channel systems. Uh, if you're going to do a sub, I think the sub should blend in with the speaker. The only reason that I have, you know, a four foot speaker instead, or sorry, probably a three and a half foot speaker instead of a nine foot tall speaker is because I can't fit a nine foot tall speaker through my door. Mm. But I can get the effect of that speaker by coupling with the sub, provided the sub blends with the speaker properly to make that speaker sound like it's nine feet tall mm -hmm. instead of the, you know, the space that it takes up now. So it, my sub, is absolutely, there's different ways to use subwoofers. Um, and one of the, the best experiences I ever got with a subwoofer demo uh, was a guy I used to work with and he wanted to show off uh, our new DB1s. Our DB1s are, you know, big 12 inch drivers. Yep. Uh, and it was an eight, 800 D3 with okay. two DB1s. Ooh. And to show off that system, he played a violin solo. <laughs> and not a, not a pump and bass track. Uh, but right. what, what happened was whenever he clicked off the sub, uh, something didn't sound right. It, it, there's nothing coming through the sub that's based on what's on the speakers, but based on what's coming through on the instrumentation. Mm -hmm. It's violin. You're not getting down to subwoofer levels. And then he told me that the subwoofer are crossed over at an extremely low frequency. I think it was like 29 hertz. 29? I was going to oh, go yeah. somewhere in the 40s, but 29? Right, exactly. He was down at 29 because the extension on 800s is huge. But when he turned it off, Something sounded wrong with the speakers, and I immediately I'm like, "What are you doing? What yeah. kind of tricks are you playing? Are you changing settings?" Like, no, no. But he, he explained it very simply. When you get to that level of performance, when you get to a high performance system, mm -hmm. a lot of the, what you're experiencing on the recording that gives you a, gives you a sense of being there is the sounds that aren't the instruments, the sound of the space, the size of the recording studio. Right. There are sound pressure levels on that recording that you can uncover with a proper subwoofer to make your entire sonic range sound better. The speakers themselves, the high frequencies, mm -hmm. sounded better with that sub because my ear was able to pick up the reproduction of the pressure levels in that space. I could actually hear the room. It was mind-numbingly good. So, Absolutely. I've had similar experience. I had a chance to go out somewhere to kind of learn how to uh, set up speakers and subwoofers and all that. And and the, the lack of not having a subwoofer in a system, it's just really different, you know, and it affects more things like vocals and the smaller instruments more than you would ever imagine. Um, so, you got to remember if I if I play a violin in this in my room here that room there's there's bass that's being created it was recorded when it happened so when it's not there like when you hear a sub with and without like that you you totally have a, an amazing experience now the other reason I would say that I have two subwoofers in my room one my room is large enough where I need to you know pressurize the room to be able to hear it but two remember I talked about when I listen to two channel music I like to feel it. You know, that's the one thing when you're at a live concert and that kick drum hits, you know, you feel it. And that's what I want out of my listening experience. I want to make my listening experience, you know, beautiful with sound staging and depth and all those all those things. But at the end of the day, I want to hear it. I want to feel it. I want to feel the music against me. And, and subwoofers allow for that because they're designed specifically for that need. So uh, I am a big fan of a subwoofer in a two channel system. And of course you'd need it for a home theater. Yeah. Great question. I have multiple subs. You, you mentioned uh, earlier, you're picking up the sound of the space. I mean, don't, don't uh, discount your ears, man. Like your ears are sensitive instruments and they can pick up with the pressure levels of a given space. If I blindfolded you and put you and walk you into a closet, you would know you were in a small space for <laughs> a big space or outside. You don't, your ears are sensitive. On, uh, ooh, just I uh, want to hit on the question just came up based on what we're talking about here, just subs. Uh, I'd love to get another subwoofer, but I think my neighbors downstairs would hate us. <laughs> and that is potentially true. However, you do want to consider there are things out there that we can do to help decouple the subwoofer from the floor. When your neighbors or anybody is hearing a subwoofer sound, that's because you've transferred the vibration of the subwoofer into the floorboards or into the ceiling or into the walls. Um, so there are feet and isolation feet and isolation pads, stuff like that out there. Anybody considering another subwoofer but might be worried about transferring the sound even in your own home maybe it's you know you're on the you know you have a 
downstairs bedroom or something or upstairs and you're worried about transferring that vibration, these things out there can help to decouple the sound. So that's a, just a good point there. Yeah, there's a, uh, our, actually our sub come with little uh, rubber feet, uh, three different versions of them. And okay. The big to help absorb some of those base waves. You can also Google moving companies for the guys downstairs. Like you can just get rid of them, just get new neighbors. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, here's a question. Uh, I'll go right to you on Seth. Do DNW in wall speakers benefit from an external enclosure beyond what is included in the box? In wall uh, speakers and external in enclosure. An external enclosure. Um, I don't. Oh, I, I think we talk about like building, like a framing it out, maybe framing out inside the stud bay or something, and building an enclosure in the wall, and then using also the baffle box. Probably, I think that's what he's talking about. Uh, not so much. I mean, once our box is in there, it's it's pretty much sealed up. Now the room may benefit from uh, having uh, some, like if you fill the walls with Roxel and you know, in, and and fill up those cavities, the room may benefit from that. Okay. If that if you're talking about actually in the wall, an external enclosure inside the wall, not so much. If you're talking about uh, putting in in wall speaker and then a bookcase in front of a wall, so to speak. That would actually degrade the sound because it'd be coming out and it would end up sounding like a, a tunnel. Right. Um, if that makes sense. Is no. That, is that? Yeah, I think I think that's what he was talking about. Art, if you, if we didn't answer that question, please reach out to us. You can email us or call us with the follow up to that question, and we can dig in a little bit deeper there for you. But thank you for asking, Art. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Art. Yeah. Once the, once that box is in the wall, it's it's pretty much. Safe. Woo. Oh, poor, the kicked my, kick my microphone. The speaker, so it got into the. Room. You breaking stuff over there, Adam? Oh doing? yeah, I'm just I'm just breaking everything. <laughs> <laughs> live, people. Oh yes, we are live, working from home. Always remember that this is not a, uh, it's not previously pre-recorded. No, this is live. <laughs> um, all right, so let's kind of recap here. We went over choosing speakers, standalone speakers. We chose talked about in-wall architectural speakers and the benefits of those. We started talking about, you know, a theater. Uh, and, and the specific speakers that are made for that. I want to go to another point in talking about maybe, you know, it could be a theater or maybe it's more of a media room, um, an external speaker and maybe maybe hanging speakers on. And there's there's speakers that you have called a, called a mini theater. Um, and these are sometimes necessity um, based on space um, or just a, a preference in terms of a look. Um, so these are small little speakers and you can start, Seth, you want to start talking about that. I have a picture I want to show everybody. I just oh, got to yeah. get it pulled up on the screen here so they can see what we're talking about here. These are, these are really cool. Um, we've, this kind of, a lot of this, this particular speaker, the M1 is a lot of people's first venture into Bowers and Wilkins. Speaker. There you go. They're extremely popular. That little guy has all types of applications. You can see it there. It's, it's stand mounted. Uh, you can also mount to the wall with a mount that it comes with. And also, we actually have a, a floor stand, a post that it essentially sits on. Yeah, mounted. floor stand. Um, yeah, whenever you don't, when space is a premium and you like the look of an external speaker, uh, these guys are awesome. They they are small speakers, so we recommend coupling them with at least one subwoofer. Uh, and uh, what you end up with is a, a pretty discreet, uh, mini theater system. So they're sold individually, so you can get as many as you want. And uh, you can mount them uh, above you uh, on the walls as heights. You can mount them through the wall. There's just lots of applications to get creative with it. You can see the center channel. It even rotates. So you can use it as a center channel with a different orientation. It's a. It's yeah. Yeah, these are really versatile folks, and 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 uh, there's a lot of different kinds of speakers like this out there. And again, what we're talking about is general, like you know, this application or this kind of solution with a with a wall mountable speaker. And it's sometimes, as we talk about, it, it's just a necessity. It's a space saver, um, or it's a look. And these things, there are lots of them out there. There's some that sound okay. There's some that sound great, and everything in between. So uh, you know, set it up, listen to music on them. Listen to your dialogue out of them. Make sure you're going to be happy with that. Um, but lots of different mounting options if you're worried about maybe cutting a speaker into the wall. You don't want to do that. Or it might be easier to just mount it or put it on a piece of furniture like this. So that's why some people choose this uh, particular style uh, for, for their room or their application. There's one other thing that, uh, that just reminded me of, Adam, as yeah. well. The, um, that M1 uh, is manufactured to the same standard that our 800s are manufactured. They're manufactured by the exact same people. Mm. Uh, there are no free lunches, so we're not using diamond dome tweeters. So, like, our bill of materials <laughs> is much lower, which is sure. why it costs much less. Yeah. But 
at the end of the day, there's no there's no B team of engineers. There's no headphone t engineer that isn't as good as a, a diamond engineer. These are the same guys that build the speaker behind me that build that little M1. So it is still a very much a Bowers and Wilkins speaker. It has that Bowers and Wilkins sonic signature. It's a really fun little speaker. So you don't start out with headphones and then work your way up to the inners. <laughs> no, that is actually the opposite. We take what we learn from the great, uh, from the, the top and top. Top. It down. Very cool. Very cool. I will say, you know, with, with speakers of that size, you know, make sure you pick a good amp to, to run them with. And I got a, a quick question here from Bruce. He just wanted to know the, the cost of those little speakers. They're 250, 250 a piece, right? Yeah. And they are available in black or white. Um, so, you know, and the wall mounts included. Wall mount included. It's a pretty cool little wall mount too. It sits right down on a little coat. Yeah, it's it's different. Yeah, it's not like a traditional mount. Like the wires actually go into the wall mount, and then you kind of click the speaker in and secure it and lock it down. So it's a neat a neat design. Yeah. Um. Let's see here. This is an. I, we get that. Oh God. Oh Derek. He's a. We're good to see you, Derek. This is, he's a repeat offender. He comes a lot to our, uh, our, Hi, our little lunch and learns and things like that. So any recommendations on active wireless speakers for rear need to do without cables? Need to do Ooh. without cables. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, there's uh, if you want to use a passive speaker, there's some companies out there that do um, a, a, like almost like I call it a wireless kit. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would go in the back of the room. You wouldn't have to transmit from one side of the room to the other. You would have to run a wire from one side of the room to the other. Yeah. Uh, and if you want a fully active wireless speaker, we have our formation line uh, that will allow you to do a five channel system in a space. It's a speaker line that we designed uh, for the, um, the the wireless networking crowd. So it communicates with the front three channels that are in our formation bar and okay. our formation subwoofer. If you want to add a, turn your five channels into a 5.1 channel system and they just plug in the wall power and they communicate wirelessly. Definitely. That's a, that's a solution there. I also wanted to bring up Derek. There's a, if in case you wanted to go more traditional, you know, and have your wired speakers up front and you're just looking for a wired solution in the back. Uh, Yamaha has a way of doing that natively. So the Yamaha receivers utilize uh, what's called their music cast technology, which uh, will let you have your three passive speakers up front. And then you have to buy the Yamaha music cast speakers. They make these small ones about, I don't know, the size of a quarter wonton kind of size speaker. And you plug it into the wall and um, it can communicate with the receiver and act as your wireless rear. So you're kind of, I don't know if some people say, well, that boxes me into music cast, but it's a great solution. I don't really know of any other receiver company that's currently doing it that way um, with getting you wireless rear. So it's a, that's a nice solution for you, Derek. I'm going to start using takeout containers as reference sizes. I think that's great. Everybody. Yeah. Right. Like I just, I, you know, it was, I think it was like two weeks ago. I was, I was on a call with a customer chatting somewhere, I don't know, across the country. I forget where, but I was describing this to them and I looked on my countertop and there was a, you know, Tupperware cause you save all of those things. Right. And right. there it was, it was a quarter wonton thing. I'm like, wow, the speaker's about that size. Everybody knows what a quarter wonton looks like about the size of a quarter wonton. <laughs> and so just, I've been saying that from, from here on out. So it's just been my, my reference point. I guess we need to figure out what's the size of a pizza box, huh? Is there anything? The yeah, of a, pizza box? a really big turntable, maybe? A, a really big in wall sub, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, anything else here? Any more recommendation? Oh, we did that. Uh, does Here we go. Does insulation help in wall cavity for in wall speakers? I think so in terms of vibration control for, for multiple reasons and for the room itself. Like just when I talked about, you know, taking care of the room, when we had that question about the small, the small room and, you know, you need to treat the room, having insulation inside of a wall helps quiet a room down. If you walk into a room and it's just sound, you sound like you're in a cave. That's a problem for sound. You're going to have some issues with how that those speakers react in your room. So insulation is certainly your first line of defense uh, in trying to quiet a room down. Anything to add Seth? Uh, yeah, it'll help quite a bit with sound abatement as well. So if there's a, someone sleeping above, like my living room, mm -hmm. uh, my bedroom is directly above me right now. So it helps to have insulation in the between rooms to help people who maybe not yeah. maybe don't want to be watching the war movie that you're watching at 2 o'clock in the morning. You're up late. <laughs> I can't. 12 o'clock, I can't make it past 12 don't, usually. Don't believe me. I got a, I got a two-year-old. I'm up at the crack of dawn every day. So. Uh, all right. Like 10, man. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Sub-question coming in. Look at this. 
So I have a question. If I like both speed and extension and I have the space or budget, would it be better to get two big ones or more than two small sealed ones? Ooh. Hmm. Um, that that's ooh, it's good. That's really going to depend on the, the subwoofer that you have uh, and the space as well, because every space is different. And my my reasoning for having two subs, uh, particularly in a theater space, has to do with the room itself and getting rid of those nulls that exist in the room. Uh, you can solve the peaks that you get in a room with good uh, good room correction software, but you're never going to fix a null. The only way to fix a null is to get another subwoofer. Yeah. So if you can get even coverage, those two subwoofers will get better depth and extension if you can get even coverage with two subwoofers. Right. Uh, if now, if we're there, there is a um, there. There is if you if you just measure up all the different drivers, like two 10 inch subwoofers versus 15 eight inch drivers like no you've got way more you've got way more uh service area on those drivers so you're going to be that's gonna that's gonna change things but if it's two tens versus two eight versus three eights i'd probably go the 10 inch route but i also don't want to commit to that because i've ever been in your space yeah so it might be something to take a look at um at a more in-depth version with one of with one of these guys so I want to get to something that just popped up right here. Um, Miss my buddy Brian here asked it. He goes, "What's the benefit of having the tweeter on top of the cabinet?" And that's always a question that we get. Uh, you know, in the showroom, people come in and they see the B and W tweeter on top technology, and everybody says, "Is that a microphone? Is it what? Why do you need a microphone on a speaker? What's up with that?" So I want to pop something up here. Maybe you can kind of explain it as it's going along. We got that nice little video here, and here we go. So this is our 702 tweeter on top. This is in our 700 series lines. Uh, and this is an exploder version of the tweeter. Uh, yeah, so why do we put, but first time I got my speakers, you know, when I first got tweeter on top, people thought it was a karaoke machine. So I did, <laughs> they really did. Um, so um, we put the tweeter on top for a lot of different reasons. The, the main one is diffraction. When you put the tweeter inside a hard surface, when the sound comes out of that tweeter, it, te- it doesn't just come out in a beam. It reflects and off the wall. And the first hard surface that it gets is the, the surface of the actual cabinet that it's inside, causing a smearing sound due to this uh, due to this uh, effect called diffraction. You can hear the effects of it if I just if you just put your hands up to your the sides of your mouth, and you can hear the sound of my voice reflecting off that, causing distortion. We put the tweeter on top so it's not affected by the enclosure that it's actually in. Hmm. Um, the other thing too is when those base drivers on that, I think it's an able to, when those yep. base drivers are firing, they're creating a lot of resonances and we try to get those resonances away from the very sensitive tweeter by putting in its own step or how the mouth to the top of the speaker. So there, there are acoustic benefits to that, to that actual speaker design. There are a lot of companies out there that make beautiful speakers that are designed to look beautiful and they try to make that shape sound good. We do things the inverse. We have a, a speaker that's built and the shape of the speaker has acoustic benefits. Mm-hmm. We have an industrial design team that makes it look good. Those guys have the hardest job in the world. So yeah, yeah, right. Make but, this look good. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so the reason it's on top is for acoustic benefits. It reduces yeah. diffraction and it keeps the resonances from the other drivers in the cabinet to a bare minimum. Right. And and, and again, step in here if I, if I misspeak, but everything derived from this technology that we showed you earlier, this is the Nautilus design. And, and these tapering, what they call tapering tubes, um, everything kind of stemmed from this project and, and going forward to what you see here in a current version of the 800 series speaker. So that Nautilus tapering tube you'll see on the screen there is not only in that tweeter, but it's also in that mid-range below. And it's off to try and really, again, the acoustical property of get rid of that back energy. So all you can really focus on is the sound coming out that the artist wanted to hear. You know, So it's a big, big acoustical property to be able to do that and they try and do it on as much as you can now again in this speaker the the 800 that's that's or the 802 that's there you don't see the tapering tubes on the woofers because remember folks it took 14 and a half feet of tubing <laughs> to make it work on a yeah, right? on a 10 inch driver so that's not realistic so they they figured out something else for the for the woofers there mm-hmm. but you can still see it though like if you look at that cabinet the shape of the cabinet the way it wraps back 
Yes. Uh, and you can actually see it on this speaker, the mid-range driver, the pod comes out. Like we okay. always are trying to reduce the effect of that diffraction. It just, it doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't just stop happening because it's not a tweeter. It happens on, uh, on everything that's coming out of the actual speaker. So we try to have that rounded face uh, on our top speakers. It is not the cheapest thing to manufacture. So it does drive up the cost a little bit, but because yeah. it does it, but we still do it because it has inherent acoustic benefits. Got it. Got it. Okay. So yeah, we don't have that's the TV. mysterious uh, tweeter on top. Everybody. It's not a karaoke machine, <laughs> although depending on what time of night it may become oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I bought my 804 and then I bought my 804s and then I had to go on a business trip like the week after. And my wife came back with friends uh, after happy hour. And one of them was like, oh, cool, karaoke. Grab. And don't, you, it's not that you can, you can grab it, but my wife didn't know that. She's like, what's up? Yeah, yeah right. Poor friend. right. Yeah, it does actually on the top right there, guys. It does uh, move a little bit. And the, the guard that's on top of the uh, or in front of the diamond tweeter is. Um, kind of fixed in place. It can come off, but it's not just going to pop right off there. So a lot of security in that uh, in that tweeter housing there. So don't worry, folks. Yeah, it's not, worry. it's not it's not a piece of glass. So <laughs> it's built for real life. <laughs> oh, Jeff, how do you fill a large room without breaking the bank? My living room is twenty two by twenty five. That's a that's a good size room uh, there, Jeff. I mean, I'm in uh, my space here is eighteen by twenty two, and I have kind of a interesting ceiling layout. I followed the, the the roof line, so it's eight foot two here, but it's eleven foot three in the back of the room, and I got a big barn beam right in the middle of it to to make the support happen. So I feel you. It's uh, I'm gonna say it's without breaking the bank. Well, it depends on what the bank is. Yeah, what's your? <laughs> <laughs> um, Good I, would point. Say, I would say subwoofers. Subwoofers yeah. definitely um, multiples because you're gonna have uh, more dead spots in a larger room. Mm. Uh, so multiple subs uh, and bigger if you can. Um, I would I, say bigger speakers if you can go inside. There's no replacement for displacement. So. Right. I would focus on when you're picking out speakers, look at their sensitivity rating and their efficiency, because that's going to help you maybe maybe get or have to get maybe a lower quality amplifier a little bit. If you have a higher efficient speaker, you can kind of cheat a little bit on, on the amplifier because the speaker is going to make up for it. Obviously, speakers like having a great amplifier on them, but when you have a really efficient speaker, it's going to put out a lot of sound with minimal amounts of power. So if you're working with a finite budget, that's somewhere I might say, if you're looking at two speakers and one's a little bit more efficient than the other one, you'd probably want to go that way. That would, that would help fill the room with sound. The other thing, I don't know if this is for theater or for music, but if it's for theater, you're going to need, you know, some type of processor, some type of amplification and the actual speaker. Start with two speakers, start with a great stereo system, and at a bare minimum, get it, get an AVR that has pre-outs. That way, you know, when that bonus comes in in a couple of years, you'll yep. be ready to go to come back and buy an external amplifier. You won't have to change any of your processing. You'll have an amplifier. You plug that bad boy in, it'll be like you got brand new speakers. Right. Good so point. Yeah. Stages as well. Yeah. Leave leave yourself an upgrade path. That's that's the best way to go. That's how I got it here. So. Uh. Here we go, Dennis. Looking for more bass, which is best? Add a sub to my two-way floor standing speakers or move to a three-way floor standing speaker? Add a sub. Yeah, add a sub. <laughs> add a sub. Add That's, you know, subwoofers, Dennis, are, are engineered specifically to create bass. Would a three-way speaker be helpful? Sure, but that's more of a, a finite tweak. You're you're really asking, how do I get more bass out of what I, what I have? You know, I can either invest in three-way floor standing speakers are going to add a sub to my existing. The subwoofer is definitely going to give you more bang for your buck as far as an investment is concerned right now. And a three-way speaker is is definitely nice to get more bass, but I think the, the bass kind of really floats more in the low mid bass, I think I'll call it, that you'd probably get more richness out of. Like If you're talking bass like movie theater bass or kick drum bass or bass guitar bass and you want to feel that in the room, go with the sub. I, I think that's the best way to go. He looks like a young guy too. He can come back and get the three ways later. I gotta look sideways. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, let's see how we got going on on our time here. 
Uh, did, let's see. We talked about wireless yet. Let's see. Standalone. Well, we did a little bit. We talked about the wireless weirds and and those kind of things. Kind of, yeah. That formation yeah. line. You want to you want to go through that? Give a quick run through. Yeah, if you want, that's fine. Go for it. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Uh, we found that in, in the industry there was uh, a choice had to be made. You could either have fantastic performance or convenience. If you get a big pair of eight hundreds and you know some nuclear power plants that drive them and you know some subwoofers. That's typically not a very convenient system where the most convenient systems that are available on the market right now that are simple to use, to use hand grandma and she can do it, don't sound very good. We want to kind of bridge that gap. We came out with Formation, which is a wireless solution. We have a couple different lines. We have a bar, a sound bar, a subwoofer to compare with any of the speakers. We have a big speaker called the Wedge. We have a small speaker called the Flex. Uh, they give the flex and use the bar and surround sounds. Uh, you control them all with your phone. Uh, you can stream to them with a variety of different music services. They're all Rune certified. I'm a huge Rune fan. Um, if you're, if you're, I got a thumbs up from Adam. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fantastic software. They can all be used with Rune endpoints. And the software that's built into them is designed so that they can connect uh, wirelessly within the same delays that you would get from a pair of wired speakers like we have back here. So when, if in the, the, the hypothetical realm, if all the drivers are the same, all the amplifiers are the same, everything in that speaker is the same, there would be no difference between its fidelity wired versus wirelessly when you're talking about delays. So, That's pretty impressive. Yeah, we're even one microsecond syncs. It's it's pretty. It's pretty I yeah, I think I remember writing that down in my training. That's I mean that's impressive, folks. That's one of the things that we deal with with uh, wireless is we always talk about delay. You know, it's it's something that is is there, and you have to think about it. And so for a speaker system to not have to worry about that. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, that's going to, yeah. that's, that's going to be great. That's going to allow you to get the sound that you're after or walk from room to room without like, Oh, that's a little behind. And it's kind of echoey when you stand in the middle, you can hear the two. And so you don't have to worry about any of that with, with that kind of stuff. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. So the problem that I, that we always ran into was when you were doing proper stereo performance, like if you had to do these things wirelessly in order to achieve that three dimensional space, that imaging, that the depth that you can get from two speakers, the magic of stereo time alignment is everything you have to have them perfectly timed up yep. and this new formation software allows us to do that without wires so the are other other people in the in the industry are probably around like a, a millisecond which is the equivalent of you picking up your speaker and moving it forward or backward about 10 centimeters okay so it's like me and adam sitting there while you're trying to listen to music moving your speakers back and forth while you're trying to listen <laughs> I think it well. Yeah, right. With the uh, plus, we have to be there while you listen to music. With the uh, with the software, they're completely synced up, so it's the same as a wired system. Wired. I mean, uh, so and as far as you know, when you would use something like this, guys. I mean, uh, applications for these speakers are fantastic. I mean, let's say you know you just have a challenge running wires somewhere. You know, wireless comes into play. Uh, or you're maybe you're renting an apartment and you don't want to you know pull wires around the room or you have small limited space in terms of for equipment i mean you remember these speakers have amplifiers in them so you're not hooking up a mac stack or, or rotels or cambridge stuff to your speakers it's, it's all self-contained you're, you're plugging you're plugging into the wall that's it yep. you know so you don't have to worry about where all that equipment goes so there's lots of great little places that that, that this fits a, a need it can also be used with uh, the legacy system. This system behind me right now, I have a piece that I forgot to mention, the Formation oh. Audio. It's my favorite piece, too. I don't know I forgot. The Formation Audio is a, a box that you plug into and use it as a source because that's the other problem that you can run into when you're trying to get music everywhere. If you've got music to, you know, the bedroom, the bathroom, the kitchen. Where's your content come from? How do you get it there? How do you get Spotify or Tidal or Cobas to that individual speaker? Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be back when we were kids, you had to plug a CD player into all of them and have a you know a little yeah. switch. Uh, now you can just stream to all the different versions, including this one. It's got a twenty four ninety six capable DAC that you can run off of Rune. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a great way to get uh, a wireless control to all your systems. So even for those vinyl guys out there, I, I'm your friend. Like. Don't take it. I'm a friend. I'm, I'm a vinyl guy too. <laughs> but these little wireless systems, it just allows you to get more music in your system and it's a ton of fun. Absolutely. So yeah, don't don't uh, forget the uh, 
a little box to plug into your system. So a bunch of companies that make them. I, I'm in love with ours, but yep. a lot of solutions. So Eric asking real quick, this is a simple, uh, simple answer. Is formation based on WISA or B&W technology? And it's yours. It's not WISA. WISA is its own thing. This is your technology. This is our technology. We had to solve those delays. For the other speaker that I forgot, which is silly, the Duos, uh, a pair of bookshelf speakers, they retail for $4,000. Yep. Uh, they lie somewhere in quality between our 705 bookshelf speaker and our 805 bookshelf speaker. Uh, 250 watts of power built into them. They absolutely slam. That uses formation technologies. So they can talk to each other wirelessly. Hmm. So, I mean, that's good stuff. I have these. These are on uh, display at the, at the showroom. Whenever I can get back there, I can go listen to them again. All right, yeah. <laughs> I have uh, I have my demo pair in my uh, in my bedroom right now. <laughs> so, oh, I feel so sad. So sorry for you. <laughs> I know. It's good. Of what, a, what a shame. <laughs> yeah, they're a ton of fun, and you just literally plug them in, and you're, they're ready to go. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, guys, we we certainly covered a lot here. We're coming up on our on our hour that we usually go for. Uh, remind everybody that tomorrow at five o'clock uh, Eastern time. We'll do our happy hour, and if we didn't get to your questions tonight, we're gonna we'll compile them all and we'll bring them tomorrow. Or you can come back tomorrow; that'd be even better, and ask us more questions. Um, we're gonna have some guys on from Worldwide Stereo. We're gonna go over some project profiles that we've done uh, specifically with with BMW, and we'll answer more questions about speaker technology and maybe help you decide what's what's the proper speaker for the room. Um, so I can't wait to get to that. Uh, right now, as all we are shipping all BMW speakers at Worldwide Stereo, except the 800 series, the Diamonds. Uh, but we can ship you any BMW speaker that you want. Uh, we have financing plans available and things like that. And if right now, I know it's uh, we're in the the, the outdoor season. The Bowers and Wilkins speakers have the uh, the AM ones. It's called. It's your traditional uh, what I call box looking speaker that mounts to the wall. And uh, it's really cool, actually. It has a, what's called a passive radiator on the back of the speaker. So we talked earlier about BMW using that back technology to try and get rid of it. Well, here they're actually doing something to enhance it. And they're taking that and they're using that back wave to create more bass. So really, really good uh, good outdoor speaker. They're on sale. They're $100 off right now. So And we can ship those out to you as well. Um, I'm going to wait and remember the 30-second delay. Any other questions coming in? Seth, anything you want to say to, to my friends here before you go? No, a great job to remember the uh, the um, the outdoor AM ones. They're a ton of fun. You get them mounted to the side of your house underneath an eave, and they just absolutely slam. So you can enjoy the outdoor weather that we're going to have for the next, you know, what, what, what three months with uh, in the Northeast. Yeah, so it'll be it'll be awesome. But uh, the other thing too, I just want to congratulate you guys on. Oh, you were ready for me. Ah, uh. <laughs> awesome system that I saw come through all the different channels of media. Uh, in the Bowers of Wilkins world, this system is absolutely fantastic. I would, I mean, it's just beautiful. Well done, guys. So this is uh, one of the systems that we'll be talking about, guys, tomorrow. So if you want to learn more about that, remember five o'clock Eastern time, Facebook and YouTube. Again, we'll do our happy hour stream. Uh, so hopefully everybody can make it. And again, bring your questions. We love helping you out. Um, Seth, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been awesome. I had fun. I'm so glad you guys did this. Bring me back. This was great. <laughs> we will do. We'll do. We'll get you on the list. Again, my friends out there, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, again, Seth, also a pleasure. Uh, we'll try and have you back as soon as possible. Everybody out there, this is Adam from Worldwide Stereo reminding you to listen to music every day. So long. <laughs>